हेलो एंड वेलकम टू बाइजूज आई ए एस लेट्स बिगेन टूडे सेशन ऑफ कॉम्प्रेहेंसिव न्यूज एनालिसिस विद द फर्स्ट आर्टिकल विच इज फोकस्ड ऑन तमिलनाडु गवर्नमेंट्स रीसेंट पॉलिसी अबाउट रीसेटलमेंट ऑफ स्लम डिवेलर्स दी ऑथर हेयर टेल्स अस दैट चेन्नई हैज हैड अ लॉन्ग हिस्ट्री ऑफ रीसेटलिंग पीपल हु हैव बीन लिविंग इन स्लम्स मोस्टली बाय रीलोकेटिंग द पीपल लिविंग इन द स्लम्स to places which are outside the city and then over the years bringing in urban facilities to that part of the city this has happened for over 2 centuries now in chennai however till october 2021 the state of tamil nadu did not really have a specific policy about resettlement of people living in the slums so in october 2021 the government released the first draft of its policy called the resettlement and rehabilitation policy the author here talks about the problems in this policy and what exactly do we need to learn from the examples of the other states now many states have adopted this measure that they resettle the people who are living in the slums by relocating them to the outer of the city you can see such examples in delhi you can see these examples in other cities such as bangalore such as chennai and many other metropolitan cities across the country now these areas where the slum dwellers are settled usually become the hub of a lot of social problems problems of alcohol problems of substance abuse criminalization of youth and also threats to women and girls living in these areas also there is another unique problem in this kind of a situation for example if a person is living in the slum inside the city the government would offer this person a small house let's say a one room house towards the outer of the city which would be much better built than the slums in many cases these people rent out these houses that are given to them by the government so that they can earn a rental income and they go back in the city again continue living in the slums this is a problem that has been seen in many states across the country and not just tamil nadu why is that because after resettlement most of these people lose their jobs the reason why they were living in a slum in the middle of the city was because they were able to find a job nearby but if you resettle all these people to a far off place most of these people would be without a job without an income and thus they resort to this technique of renting out the accommodation that the government had given to them The author says that rather than following the policy that we have right now in Tamil Nadu, we can learn from the example of Odisha. What the Odisha government has done is, rather than relocating the people living in the slums, the Odisha government has tried to settle the people in the slum itself by giving them more facilities, by improving the infrastructure. and making it a properly developed area by giving the land rights to the slum dwellers themselves which means the government rather than shifting them is looking to follow the model of in situ development not just this the tamil nadu government's draft policy says that the place where we will relocate these slum dwellers would be not more than half an hour away from the nearest urban area from where these people are expected to relocate so for example if this is chennai in the middle of somewhere here let's say there was a slum the people would be shifted to somewhere in this area where they will take at max half an hour to reach the urban area now you might take half an hour to reach the border of the city but from there to go to the place where you are working it will still take a lot of time and money so relocating people by saying that it will only take them half an hour to reach the nearest urban area is not a very sound policy the author says that comparatively the delhi government's policy for resettlement is much better the delhi government policy specifically says that the people will be relocated to within 5 km radius of their current accommodation so the people living in the slums can have an exact idea where they would find a new place to live so the problem of slum settlement may be seen as a problem of developing nations but if you look at the history many developed nations around the world including us uk france germany 
used to have this issue. For example, if you read about industrial revolution in UK, the reason why industrial revolution was successful was because there was a large scale migration from rural areas in UK to the urban centers such as Manchester, where people came in large numbers, settled down in slums and started working as workers in the industry. They were paid such low salary by the industries that they could not afford a proper housing. So they had to live in a slum. So the concept of slum is also a Western concept. It was not a concept that was initiated in India. The British then took this idea to India. In fact, India's largest slum, that is Dharavi in Mumbai, was actually made by the British and it's not a creation that took place after independence. This was the information given to us by the author in this article. Now let's have a look beyond this article and see what other information do we need to know about the slums, the problem of people living in the slums and what exactly are the reasons behind these problems. It is estimated that about 17.4% of urban households in India are actually informal housing or slum. Out of these people, only 60% of them have access to piped water and that to only for two hours a day. In comparison, WHO recommends that a person must have access to at least 50 liters water per day in a non-emergency situation it means when the person is not ill just for his day-to-day -day activities. But the people living in the slum have far lesser water at their disposal. As I said, this is not a problem that is unique to India. Developing nations around the world and nearby India are facing this problem. There are multiple slum improvement projects going on in Bangladesh, Kenya, Nairobi. Within India also, in Delhi, there is an area called Katputli Colony. It's in central Delhi, where the government is trying to develop the area without relocating the people and trying to give them the rights of the land where they have been living. If you want to take an example of places far away, Mexico is home to one of the largest slums in the entire world. And they also have been trying to resettle people in the slums. Now, what exactly are the reasons behind having so many slums in the country? There are three main reasons that we ignore. The first reason is lack of urban planning. You can go to the most modern cities in India and you will still find amenities which are much below par. You will still find roads that are not well maintained. You will still find even the best of Indian cities facing the problems of floods and water logging when there is too much rainfall. You still see places where people are forced to live in slums because there are not enough housing options available. One of the reasons are that in the past, whenever we have planned for a city, we have not planned keeping in mind the population growth rate that India would experience. For example, if we are building a highway right now, rather than making it a 10 or a 12 lane highway because the traffic would only increase in the future, our planners are happy to just make it a four lane highway so that the current situation is solved. But in the future, the problem will come up once again. Our cities were not planned keeping in mind that there will be a large scale migration from rural to the urban areas and the population of India will increase at a great pace. I will give you a very simple example so that you can understand. Let's compare two well-known cities, Mumbai and New York. If you have traveled to foreign countries in Europe or in US, you would notice that one of the biggest differences between our big cities and their big cities is that in our big cities, you will find a lot of electricity poles, you will find a lot of wires going overhead. But in cities of Europe or US, you won't really see a lot of wires overhead. Most of the wires, be it for electricity, be it for broadband or other purposes are underground. Now, why have we not done the same? Let me give you a very simple example. In Mumbai, of the entire area under the city, only 9% area is under the streets. In comparison, 40% of New York's area is under the streets. Now, what is the significance of this? When the government is building public infrastructure, let's say the government has to install certain wires. 
the government can only install wires underneath the public street right the government can't come to your house and tell you to vacate your house so that under your house the government can draw some wires right they won't do that and you would not allow them to do that in our city such as mumbai when it was planned we did not realize the fact that in the future we would need to put a lot of wires a lot of infrastructure for which we would need a lot of public land so about 91% area of mumbai does not come under streets meaning that we only have this 9% area for building underground infrastructure which is so critical for the country this highlights a lack of urban planning we are learning from this if you belong to chatisgarh you would know the new raipur city or naya raipur as it is called which is a planned city completely built from the scratch and will be the new capital of chatisgarh replacing raipur the city has been extremely well planned under which 30% of land will be used for residential and economic purposes while 23% land will be reserved for government and educational institutions now we obviously can't do that with already existing big cities like mumbai and delhi but we can still learn from this and make sure that our future development plans are on track the second issue responsible for slum development is large scale rural to urban migration as per the official census data between 2001 and 2011 close to 7.8 crore people migrated from rural to the urban areas now when these people are migrating from rural to the urban areas you can imagine that they won't be financially very strong so would they be able to afford housing in an urban area obviously not thus the only option that they would have is to settle in a slum where they would have to pay either zero or a very minimal rent what is the government doing to tackle this problem i am sure you all would have read about manrega manrega is not just about giving employment in the villages it is also about stopping migration from the rural to the urban areas so that the people can get livelihood in their own villages without having the need to shift to the cities there is another interesting point in manrega under which at least 33% of the jobs in manrega are reserved for women because you have to understand from a family if a man migrates from a village to a city most probably the man would migrate alone and would start sending money to the household in the village but if a woman has to migrate in search of work most probably her entire family would migrate with her so a women's migration means migration of multiple people so manrega aimed at stopping women migration by reserving 33% jobs for women has this been successful or not yes it has been because under manrega more than 50% jobs right now are given to women so it has been successful in stopping migration from rural to the urban areas considerably the third issue that we have is lack of affordable housing property rates especially in metro cities are over the roof so much so that you can buy a better house in new york at the same price as you would buy a smaller house in delhi there are no government regulations when it comes to pricing of private property which also is leading to high rents and forcing people to live in the slums even if they are earning some amount of money the next article in the hindu newspaper that we will be discussing today is on the wto recently our commerce and industry minister piyush goel suggested that the wto must ensure that the rules are same for every country the wto must ensure that it works transparently without naming any country the minister said that the developed nations are pressurizing the wto to work only in their favor the minister said that india unlike many other countries has been 100% transparent with every decision of the government his words not my words so this is what he is saying the minister also said that the developed nations should not expect similar treatment to be given to developing nations or the poor income nations the minister said that if a country has 600 dollars as a per capita income the country cannot be treated on the same lines as another country having 60000 dollars as a per capita income so there has to be a different parameter for dealing with countries in the wto 
Now, this gives us a chance to look at the working of the WTO and what is the fight between the developing and the developed nations. Firstly, understand this. As per the WTO, there is no definition of developed or developing nations. A government is free to decide whether or not they want to be a developing nation or a developed nation. So if the government of India tomorrow stands up and says that we are now a developed nation, there is no one who can stop us from doing that. So why do we say we are a developing nation? Because if we consider ourselves as a developing nation, then we get certain preferential treatment from the WTO. For example, if the WTO says that we should cut down on the taxes, then the developed nations have to do it as soon as possible. Developing nations get a little more time to implement those policy changes. That is why we prefer being called a developing nation as compared to a developed nation. You would have noticed recently when Donald Trump was a US president, he had raised objections about India and China still calling themselves as a developing nations and taking advantage of the WTO rules. But we are free to do that. Another interesting fact here is that India is a blend country. Now, what do you mean by a blend country? I'm sure all of you would have read about the World Bank group. The World Bank has multiple components out of which I will discuss about two. That is IBRD, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development and IDA, International Development Association. Now, both of these arms of the World Bank give loans to the countries. The difference being that the countries that are the poorest in the world get loan from IDA. On the other hand, the countries which are not that poor take loan from the IBRD. Obviously, the rate of interest of IDA is much lower. Now, the World Bank says that IDA will be giving loans to those countries that have a per capita income of $1,145 or lower than that. If a country has a per capita income higher than this, then their loan will be given by the IBRD at a higher rate of interest. Now, let's take the case of India. India's per capita income is more than this number. But when we have to take loan from the World Bank, we say, no, 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 we still will take loan from the IDA. Why? Because see, we are still very poor. So although our per capita income level, if you can see here, is above the IDA parameter, but we still take loans from the IDA and some loans from the IBRD also. Why? Because we want to take advantage of our status of a poor or a developing nation. So India in that sense is a unique country where we are the Vishwa Guru in the morning, but in the evening time, we want to be a poor country in the world so that we can take loan at a lower rate of interest as compared to the others. That is why India is called a blend country. Blend country means those nations which actually take loan from both the arms. And it's not that India is the only one. There are some other countries also that are in this particular category. There is one more issue about the WTO that you need to understand. WTO has a body called the WTO appellate body. Under this, decisions taken by the WTO can be appealed by the governments. This appellate body is usually a seven member body and it requires a minimum of three members to hear any case. However, since the end of 2020, this body has zero members. Why? Because the US believes that the WTO is not working in our interest. So the US has stopped appointment to this body. Since 2020, it has zero members meaning that it has not had any meeting and the US has not allowed appointment of any new member. So all the appellate cases are still pending here. US is like that kid, you know, who owns the cricket bat that I will not allow anyone else to play if you don't play by my rules. Now, can the US do that? Yes, it can. Why? Not because the US has the most power in WTO, but because the law is that WTO works on the basis of consensus. So all the decisions of the WTO will be taken when every country agrees to that. And if the US says no, the people, the countries who are scared of the US won't put a lot of pressure. That is why since 2020, this body has zero members. 
In fact, it has not been working since 2019 when only one member was available. But in 2020, even that single member's tenure got over. Since then, it has no members. So you can see WTO has become a punching bag for the countries who just want to push it according to their requirement. The next article that we have is regarding the powers of the Lok Sabha speaker. We discussed yesterday also about the ongoing All India Presiding Officers Conference. In this conference, one of the matters of discussion was about the powers of the speaker and is there a need to change the same. There was a committee headed by Rajasthan Speaker C.P. Joshi that gave a report under which the speaker's powers, especially with regards to the anti-defection law, needs to be looked into. Now, what exactly is this? As you know, anti-defection law says that if a legislator changes his or her party, for example, if there is a BJP member of parliament, he or she resigns from the BJP, joins the Congress, then that legislator shall be disqualified. This decision of disqualification under the anti-defection law shall be taken by the presiding officer of the house. So if it is a Lok Sabha member, the Lok Sabha speaker will have to decide on the disqualification matter. Simple. Now this has led to a lot of controversy. We will discuss that. Before that, let's see the other things that were discussed in the conference. The Lok Sabha speaker, Sri Om Birla, said that there is a need to increase the number of sittings of the parliament. Also, the standing committees in the parliament need to be empowered and need to be given a lot more importance than they are given. Also, a lot of state legislatures don't have a concept of zero hour that should also be introduced because the zero hour is a time that gives a chance to the MLAs to bring in issues related to their specific constituency. Now, coming back to the point of speaker and his powers. Let's take a very simple example. If you look at the present scenario, you would imagine that people from non-BJP parties would like to switch to the BJP because they are in a stronger position. So let's assume that there is a Congress member of parliament who resigns from the Congress and joins the BJP. Now, officially under the anti-defection law, the member of parliament should be disqualified. The disqualification decision will be taken by the Lok Sabha speaker. But the Lok Sabha speaker belongs to which party? He belongs to the BJP. So would the Lok Sabha speaker who belongs to the BJP disqualify a member of parliament who has just come in the BJP? There is a good chance that the speaker would want to find certain excuses so that the person is not disqualified. The biggest excuse here is that the speaker does not have any specific time period under which he or she has to take that disqualification decision, which leads to all this controversy. Let me give you an example of what happened in Manipur so that you can understand how big the problem can become. So in 2017, BJP formed their government in Manipur, not because they had won the election. How they formed the government was seven MLAs from Congress, switch to the side of the BJP. Now, obviously, under the anti-defection law, these MLA should be disqualified. So the Congress asked the Manipur speaker to disqualify these members. Manipur speaker was from the BJP because BJP was in power. So they had nominated the speaker from their party. Now, the Manipur speaker said, OK, I will think about it and I will see if the person has to be disqualified or not. He kept on thinking for many months. In 2018, the Congress had to go to the Manipur High Court saying that the speaker is going against the constitution and please ask the speaker to disqualify these MLAs. However, the Manipur High Court said that the law does not put any time limit on the speaker to take such a decision of disqualification. So we cannot interfere in this matter. Thus, in January 2020, Almost two and a half years after the MLAs had changed their side, the Congress went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said that although the law does not put a time limit, but within three months, the speaker should decide on the decision of the disqualification. And guess what? Even after the Supreme Court decision, the speaker did not decide to disqualify these people. 
finally the supreme court itself had to come in between and in march 2020 the supreme court interfered and disqualified these mlas who had changed sides from the congress to the bjp see whatever you say about the speaker you at least have to understand that he was an extremely loyal person to his party when he should have been loyal towards the constitution of india these examples highlight how the speaker's powers can be misused and thus there is a need to take this power from the speaker and maybe give this power to the president or the governor. Now, it is also important to see some international examples of how the other countries treat with their speakers. Ireland, for example, has a very similar parliamentary system to India. Their speaker also has powers which are very comparable to that of the Indian Lok Sabha speaker. Just that in Ireland, the speaker usually is that person who has a lot of good credibility and who is not in the race for any political position. What about Britain? In Britain, there's a very unique situation about the speaker of their lower house. Their lower house is called the House of Commons. So whoever becomes the speaker of the House of Commons first has to resign from his or her party. Secondly, the speaker has to be ensured that even if you don't work in favor of your party, you will still get a ticket in the next election. How does that happen? There is a very interesting convention in Britain. That is, whoever is the speaker of the lower house in the next election, from wherever the speaker is contesting the election, no political party will field any candidates against him or her. So if I am the speaker of Lok Sabha in the next election, whichever seat that I am contesting from, no other political party will field any candidate. Why? So that I can win the election and I will not be dependent on my political party to give me a ticket. That allows the speaker to work independently. Not just this, in UK, if the speaker decides that they don't have to contest the next election, then the speaker of the lower house is automatically nominated for a term in the upper house. So if their term in the house of common is over, in the next term, they automatically will be nominated in the house of lords again to ensure that they have independence from their political party. None of that is done in India. In US, the speaker is allowed to openly engage in active politics. In US, it is very clear that the speaker will take the side of his or her party. But at least in US, it is very clear and the political parties can then prepare their stand accordingly. The next article that we want to discuss today is based on the Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses Act, that is the POXO Act. The reason why it is in the news is because of the recent Supreme Court verdict that caused the Bombay High Court judgment. Now, what was the case exactly? The case was that an adult was charged for sexually assaulting a child in Maharashtra. This person forced himself upon the child and touched the breast of this girl child. When the case went to the Bombay High Court, the Bombay High Court said that because there was no skin to skin contact, that is when this adult forced himself upon this poor child, the child was wearing complete clothes. The adult was also wearing complete clothes because there was no skin to skin contact. We have decided that this is not a case of sexual harassment. So the Bombay High Court had given a clean chit to this man. Fortunately, the Supreme Court on November 18 overturned the decision of Bombay High Court saying that the intent of this act matters and not skin to skin contact. If the intent of the man was wrong, if it was sexual in nature, then it will be considered as a sexual assault even if it did not involve any skin to skin contact. This gives us a chance to see the details of this particular law. Does it need to be changed or is it working well now? This law was introduced in India in 2012, especially to protect children, that is people below the age of 18 years from instances of sexual assault. In 1992, the UN Convention on the Rights of Child was ratified by India. So India was under compulsion to have such a law. Understand this that even before 2012, India did have the IPC, the Indian Penal Code, under which 
देर वॉज अ पनिशमेंट फॉर सेक्शुअली असोल्टिंग अ वीमेन बट द पॉक्सो एक्ट इज स्पेसिफिकली फॉर प्रोटेक्टिंग द चिल्ड्रन एंड टॉक्स अबाउट अ मोर स्ट्रिंजेंट पनिशमेंट एज कंपेयर टू द आई पी सी दी ऑथर हेयर सीज दैट इन ऑर्डर टू मेक श्योर दैट दिस काइंड ऑफ अ प्रॉब्लम डज नॉट अराइज अगेन वे आर द कोर्ट डिपेंड्स ऑन स्किन टू स्किन कॉन्टैक्ट टू फाइंड फॉल्ट इन द पर्सन द लॉ शुड बी चेंज एंड शुड राधर टॉक अबाउट द सेक्शुअल इंटेंट ऑफ द पर्सन बिहाइंड द एक्ट The author gives an example of the Sexual Offences Act 2003 of UK, which says that touching with sexual intent includes touching with any part of the body, with anything else, or through anything. The Pogso Act must also ensure that these details are mentioned in the Act so that these don't go unpunished. This article also brings to light one of those issues which are seen on a large scale in the Indian society. but unfortunately are not discussed openly due to the social stigma attached to it thus it gives us a chance to look deeper into this law and what are the problems associated with this particular act the one good thing about this act is section 29 section 29 says that if a person is charged under this particular act the special court while trying this case will presume automatically that the person is guilty unless the person provides a concrete proof of not being guilty meaning that the burden of proving that the person is innocent lies on the person who has been charged with this although it seems to be good but in reality the law has been much below expectations why number 1 the conviction rate under the law is extremely low in 2018 only 19% people were convicted meaning that out of the 100 people on whom the case was filed only 18 people were punished while the other 82 people were let go because of various reasons not just this about 89% cases in this act are still pending and have not been heard by the court there are a lot of reasons behind this number 1 it is not easy for the child to tell details about what happened with him or her second in many cases the police or the investigative agencies are not trained enough on how to investigate the child which increases this problem the law says that there should be special children court that should be set up for these cases but most states have not set up these courts in most states it is the orthodox courts that hear these cases the other interesting point is while this act says that the maximum punishment should be death penalty but there have been multiple committees and even a law commission report in the past that have advised against imposing death penalty in rape cases as well so there is a conflict in the two the fourth point which is also pretty interesting is that the law says that minimum sentence given under this law should be 3 years at least now there have been cases in the past where the courts have said that we accept that the person has done something wrong but he has not done so much wrong that we should give him 3 years in jail so because the law does not allow us to give anything less than 3 years we are letting this person go just by giving him or her a warning this is very strange but true this has happened in the state of jammu and kashmir versus vijayananda case where the court said that the minimum punishment given is very high and we think that the offense is not that serious so we are just warning the person and we are letting him go this also brings to question the utility of the law and the ability of the courts to hold the person responsible behind this serious offense The next article from the Hindu newspaper today is about center government's efforts to improve relationships with the states. The center government recently announced that it will release more than ninety-five thousand crore rupees to the states this month itself, which is earlier than they had promised, so that the states can have more money at their disposal and they can invest that money in the capital expenditures in their respective states. the government also said that it will give a chance to the state governments to increase their public investment which will set an example for the private sector also 
leading them to invest more money in the development of the respective states. This was decided after an informal meeting in which all the chief ministers and the finance ministry from the center along with the commerce ministry participated. Now it is important to understand here that ever since the GST regime has been introduced in India, the financial relations between the center and the state governments in India have not been very good because of various issues. For example, we had the issue of GST compensation. What was that exactly? When the GST was introduced, it cut down the power of the state governments to impose taxes on a lot of things. The state governments were now only allowed to impose taxes on alcohol, petrol and stamp duty. For everything else, they had to depend on the rate of GST decided by the GST council itself. The main difference between GST and earlier law is that GST is a consumption based tax and not a manufacturing based tax. Now, what is the difference between the two? Let's take a very simple example. Let's imagine that Tamil Nadu, Gujarat, Maharashtra, these are the states that invested a lot in their industrial infrastructure. They invited corporates to come to their states, set up industries so that there can be a lot more manufacturing. Why? Because when someone manufactures something in their industry, these states thought, okay, then we will impose excise duty. That means a tax on manufacturing. So when we have more industries, more manufacturing will happen, then we will earn more taxes. Now with the GST, what has happened is the state governments cannot impose excise duty. GST is a tax that is given to a state where consumption is happening. So for example, if I am sitting in Delhi and I order a car that is made in Tamil Nadu, because I am consuming the product in Delhi, GST over that car will be given to Delhi and not to Tamil Nadu. So Tamil Nadu's tax that they would have got based on the manufacturing is now gone. The states where more consumption is happening will get more taxes. The state which invested in their infrastructure, which improved their manufacturing, etc. will not get taxes now. This was the problem with the GST that many of the manufacturing states had raised. So the government of India had said that for the first five years from 2017 to 2022, if these states, specifically the manufacturing states, have a loss of revenue. For example, earlier, if they were earning, let's assume 50,000 crore from taxes and after GST, they are only earning 40,000 crore. Then the government said that we will compensate you for any deficit that you are facing for the first five years from 2017 till 2022. How will it be calculated? It will be calculated by seeing how much taxes did the state government earn in 2015-16 and we will assume that every year your taxes will increase by 14%. So if you earn less than that by GST, then we will give you the compensation. This was the law. However, last year in 2020, because of the lockdown, because of the low GST collections, the center government said that we cannot compensate you. We are sorry. Why? Because we don't have enough money. So the state governments got very angry. They said that you introduce a GST while give, promising us that you will compensate. And now you are saying that you can't compensate us. What do we do? When the state governments asked the reason to the center government, did you know what they said? The center government said it is the act of God. Just like that movie, Oh My God, in which Paresh Rawal is fighting a case against the God. So the center government said it's an act of God because of which we did not get enough money in the GST. So we can't compensate you. Simple. Since then... There has been a lot of bad blood between the center and the state governments, especially those state governments who have lost a lot of their income with the introduction of the GST, mainly the manufacturing states. So the center government is now trying to improve its relations with the state by saying, okay, whatever we owe you for this year, we will give you in advance as soon as possible so that you can increase your spending. There is one more interesting thing in that article. If we go back here, the article makes a mention here about the states achieving their KPEX target and being allowed to borrow more money. Now, what exactly is this? In this year's budget, the center government announced 
that we are giving a target to every state on how much money they should spend in their capital expenditure. Capital expenditure means building roads, building infrastructure. So they gave a target to every state. And the central government said that if by the end of the second quarter, that is by the end of September this year, if the state governments are able to spend 45% of that target, then we will allow the state governments to borrow more money from the market. How much more? 0.5% of their gross state domestic product. So the central government had said that every state in India can borrow up to 3.5% of their gross state domestic product. But if some states achieve this target, that is if after two quarters, they have already spent 45% of their target on capital expenditure, then those states can borrow 0.5% more money from the market. So for them, the market limit of borrowing will be 4%. These are those states that have achieved the target. Telangana, Punjab, Rajasthan, MP, Kerala, Chhattisgarh, Meghale. The article thus says that since the center government is now giving more money to the states, the other states can also increase their spending and the other states can also achieve this target by the end of the third quarter so that they will be allowed to borrow more money from the market. So if you actually see what is happening here is center government is not giving any extra money to the states. First, they are saying whatever we owe you anyway, we will give you a few days earlier. Secondly, what we will do is we will allow you to borrow more money from the market borrowing that you only have to return. We will not return it for you, but we'll just allow you to borrow more money. So it's not an extra help given by the center. It's more about allowing the state governments to borrow more money. These were the articles that we wanted to discuss from today's Hindu newspaper. Now a couple of mains practice questions. Number one, in the light of the recent clashes between the center and the state governments, suggest ways to invigorate center state relations in the country. Second, do you agree with the perception that WTO has failed to live up to its expectations and must reinvent itself to fulfill its mandate? Elaborate on the reasons behind your argument. Both of these again have to be answered in 250 words each. Thank you so much for watching the video.